This is Look West, a podcast from California's Assembly Democrats. Stay tuned at the end of this episode for details on accessing mental health care. Mental health. Are we getting access to resources and proper care? How have we accomplished breaking the stigma? And can we do more? I'm Talitha DeMessa with Look West. Our podcast team took a trip to San Francisco to witness California's launching of the first statewide mental health line. This will help improve access to mental health resources and break the stigma surrounding mental health conversations. We had the chance to speak with three individuals that are paving the way for mental health care access and the stigma around it. I'm Mark Salazar, the Executive Director of the Mental Health Association of San Francisco. Mark started at MHASF as a Director of Operations, overseeing the peer support and recovery and peer workforce development departments. My name is Cheryl. I'm one of the Assistant Program Managers for the Warm Line. Cheryl helps supervise a team of peers and is a peer listener herself, giving her firsthand experience with those who need support. Phil Ting, assembly member from San Francisco. The assembly member's efforts championed a budget that helped fund a statewide crisis warm line. It's important to recognize that our mental health goes hand in hand with our physical well-being. One is definitely not more important than the other. Even the World Health Organization defines health as, quote, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease, unquote. While we might recognize these things, acquiring resources may be the challenge. Mark told me how, for some, resources are scarce. Everybody has a mental health issue anyway. Uh-huh. It doesn't matter what part of life you are, what mm-hmm. profession, whatever it is. You have mental health issues. It's just how you find that balance. Some right. of us find it pretty well. You know, we, we exercise. We do things that really help our mental wellness. But there's so many other people that are left uh, on the ends right. who don't have that, that ability to... Um, get access to services Mm -hmm. or have those coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. If you think acquiring mental health care is difficult, he says it's even more so for underserved and marginalized communities. Race and ethnicity and sexual orientation are barriers people face. Even after the Affordable Care Act, coverage for behavioral and mental health care treatment is still costly. Mark and the assembly member say that lack of financial resources can also lead to inadequate treatment. For many things that many families take for granted, whether it's housing, whether it's food, whether it's health care, just the most basic types of services that many people rely on, um, that, that net is not there for many families who are living in poverty. Uh, they're trying to figure out where their next meal is. They're trying to figure out uh, where they're sleeping that particular night. They're trying to figure out um, what to do if somebody gets catastrophically ill. Mm-hmm. So um, these are all things that we, we know impact people's mental health. If you had to deal with these issues on a daily basis, yeah. it, it takes a huge toll. We, we know that the majority of families in this country don't have enough money to save $500 and put it away in their bank account, yeah. which means that any little crisis... Uh, if you're lucky enough to own a car, if something happens to the car, you don't have the money to fix the car, it can't get to work. So um, any little crisis could throw your life into, um, in, into a whole different place than it was the day before. Right. And so, um, again, this, this is just the reality of what happens when you don't have money or resources to really solve your problems or just to meet your everyday basic needs. And that takes a huge toll on, on right. your mental health. Yeah, I mean, I just want to add, you know, that the $500 someone's trying to save, it costs about 100 to $140 per hour just to even see a therapist. So, like, you know, assembly member Ting Ting was saying, you know, if you have an emergency, would you rather spend it on food or seeing a therapist? You know, that choice is really difficult. And obviously, you you know, try to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. Timothy Creedon, a research scientist at Cambridge Health Alliance, did a study in 2016 on how the Affordable Care Act would increase access to mental health treatment for racial and ethnic minority groups. The National Survey of Drug Use and Health reveals, however, that white people are the only racial group in which majority of people with severe psychological distress get treatment and more than half of people facing severe mental health illness who are Black, Hispanic, or Asian don't get treatment at all. Creedon said there was some hope with the ACA boosting coverage for everyone, and in particular, minorities who have historically been left out of insurance coverage, you'd see a little more help for folks in those groups. The National Alliance on Mental Health Illness states, 
quote, LGBTQ people with mental health conditions may also find themselves fighting a double stigma. Many will experience prejudice based on their sexual and or gender identity, as well as the stigma associated with mental illness, unquote. They also emphasize that treatment and family support are vital to helping LGBTQ communities live well with a mental health condition. But because of the stigma, many people struggle in silence and face worse health issues as a result. Assemblymember Phil Ting wrote Assembly Bill 512, which focuses on the importance of every county's mental health plan to collect data and include marginalized and underserved communities for equal access to quality mental health services. AB 512 was a very important bill to me, really dealing with mental health. We see mental health challenges on our streets every day here in San Francisco. Uh, We hear about it all over the state of California. Uh, And mental health is really not just people who are on the street talking to themselves. They're the right. people who go to work, they're people at school, mm-hmm. they're, they're really people uh, at everyday lives who, um, like everyone else in the world, just have are having a tough day. Right. And, and again, we thought it was so important that for every county mental health plan is that we really identify uh, and make sure it was fully inclusion inclusionary so so again we wanted to make sure that they uh, looked at disparities by access wow. utilization outcomes by race ethnicity language sexual orientation gender disability income uh, we really wanted to have a much fuller look of what that data shows o- oftentimes um, in in regards to data it's always the most obvious community that people collect data about. It's not the quiet community. And what we often have times is within communities of color, right. uh, mental health is an issue that just is not discussed. It is mm-hmm. not uh, hourly talked about. You can't even discuss it behind closed doors, mm-hmm. frankly. And so we really wanted to make sure that communities who have a hard time even broaching the subject were being counted and uh, taken care of. Uh, again, we also wanted to make sure that there were annual performance metrics regarding reduction and disparity and utilization right. uh, to make sure that we were, again, making progress. And, and again, every every county has a mental health health plan. It's just important that these facts and figures were included in it. Mark also gave me his thoughts on AB 512. The whole revolution of the ACA um, brings, you know, the equal access mm-hmm. to physical health services, but mm-hmm. they tend to forget the mental health services right. and AB 512 helps bring that parity up to par with physical mental health, uh, physical uh, health issues. And so that's why we believe that AB 512 is a great um, starter. Right. It's a great way to have the conversation for people in communities that never really speak out right. about right. you know, mental health. As an Asian myself, mm-hmm. we, we never did discuss mental health in, mm-hmm. in my household. So th- these kind of things really encourage that. And, and that's why we, you know, we're very supportive of it. AB 512 did not become law this year, but the assembly member is promising to introduce it again next year. On the upside, a state budget allocation of $10.8 million over three years help fund the first California statewide mental health line. This was made possible by Governor Gavin Newsom, State Senator Scott Weiner, and Assembly Member Phil Ting. The Assembly Member gave me his thoughts on mental stress in California and expressed his gratitude for the mental health warm line. Mental health issues pop up all around the state of California. Mm -hmm. Uh, You see it really everywhere. And and when people think of uh, mental health, I think they think of the most extreme versions of mental health illness. Uh, What they don't really understand is everyone has everyday stress. Everyone has stress getting to work, Mm -hmm. getting their kids to school, just putting dinner on the table. Uh, That impacts your mental health. So so again, um, the most simple of tasks that we have to do in our everyday, whether it's having to get through traffic or riding the bus, uh, creates stress. And that yes. stress really impacts our yeah. mental health. And that really is uh, where we're trying to, what we're trying to do is trying to not just help the people who have the most uh, challenging uh, situations in mental health. It's really, how, how, do we, how do you help people just sort of manage their everyday right. mental health? And what can, what can we do? I mean, that, that's one of the reasons we were here earlier today to talk about the peer warm line Uh because it's just one of the simplest ways to help people manage their mental health it's it's not saying hey if you're calling you have a problem all it is is saying hey you're calling because you just want someone to talk to you you don't want to be alone 
for whatever reason. Uh And it's a great reason for just someone to pick up the phone and just talk to someone else on the other line. The California Peer Run Warm Line is toll free and open to anyone and everyone. It was modeled on the city funded San Francisco Peer Warm Line, which opened in 2014 and is run by the Mental Health Association of San Francisco. Like everyone else, we were curious as to why it's called a warm line. Cheryl, the warm line veteran, gave me her take. It started out the kind of uh, analogy we give is that, you know, you think of like a hotline, kind of like a boiling pot. Mm-hmm. And so the warm line is our goal is to kind of get you know, keep that water from getting to the boiling point. Meaning, you know, and crisis looks different for everybody, but we say non-crisis in the sense that like, if you know that things are breaking down for you and you're not feeling well, whatever that looks like for you, um, you don't have to wait until you need necessarily like a suicide hotline or you need to like, you know, take yourself into a hospital and get some like emergency services. Like you can de-escalate possibly by calling someone who one has been there and two is effective at listening and really hearing you out and seeing what would be most effective for yourself. Um, and so one of our values is empowering our callers. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically that just means like, what do you think you need in this situation and how can I best support you to meet that need Uh realistically? Um, and so I feel that is oftentimes what a lot of our callers explain is with, you know, crisis lines, it's very like down the line questions. Are you feeling suicidal? Are you going to hurt yourself? Mm -hmm. Like, whereas, you know, calling our warm line, it's really just a chance for you to just get it all out, um, and see where we can go from there. And the, beautiful thing about that is also you can call multiple times a day. So it's not like it's just a one-time thing and you have to wait until you get better or not, whatever that looks like, but Mm -hmm. you can check in and we can call you and we can check in with you and see how you're doing. And you don't necessarily get those services with other lines. During the news conference announcing the warm line, Sarah Jean Flynn, the California Warm Line Program Manager, read some feedback from some of their callers. Over and over again, we hear the same themes and feedback from our callers. The warm line was there when no one else was. The warm line is a lifeline. The warm line counselors get it. They get mental health because they've had those challenges too. You guys have saved my life over the last three years. I don't know what I would have done if it weren't for you guys to be able to pick up the phone and have someone who understood and was empathetic. You never think that you're going to grow up and follow all the rules and you end up homeless and alone. So you guys saved me. I'm okay now. It's been three years and I'm okay now, but it's because of the warm line. I asked Mark and Cheryl about their experiences in working for an organization when they are the resources and how their own mental health challenges help better equip them in helping others. I think being, you know, formally taking calls on the warm line and being a peer, I think Uh just acknowledging that I am a peer has been really empowering. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not easy to tell people, yes, I have experience with mental health challenges, um, but now you have a space where you can use that as an asset and once again, help people out um, and whatever that looks like. Um, And so just changing the way that I think about mental health, thinking about what mental health looks like for everyone else, Mm -hmm. um, because it differs. And being more descriptive instead of prescriptive and seeing, okay, like this is what someone's going through. How can I best support them through this moment and not necessarily how can I solve their issues or their challenges? Um, And so it's instilled a lot of patience and a lot of compassion that I didn't necessarily have for myself or for the community initially. Yeah, I mean, for me, just to dovetail on what Cheryl was saying is that uh, people finding out that I'm the ED of this place, all my friends and and colleagues in (laughs) in, the the professional world, they they do text me and call me and ask, you know, I'm going to a rough patch. What do I do? And so it's been easy for me um, professionally just to say, hey, call our warm line. That's somebody, you know, that's someone you can call and anytime you want, uh-huh. um, you know, and I also, offer, you know, tell them there's a bunch of services that you could call and, and you know, I do some research for them and kind of refer them to resources. So it, it is, you know, I, I have surgeons like texting me going, hey, I need some help. Right. I don't know what to do. I have um, people who run big healthcare facilities who just are unsure what to do with mental health. Yeah. And, and so I think um, me, being in this role has given me that opportunity to help other people. They also told me about some specific challenges that they face. I think a big chunk of it um, was stigma on my part and just not knowing where to start. Um, and having lived in a low-income household, I don't think... 
I had until I started working here, I hadn't connected just how traumatizing um, housing insecurity and living in poverty can be and how much that directly impacted my mental health. Um, and so it was really just about initially reaching out and understanding why I was needing to reach out and how I could support myself in, in an ideal environment um, and something that was out of my control. And then even now, it's just not having access to enough professionals or people, um, you know, um, for me, I, I think if you really look at it, it the biggest um, challenge is the stigma around it. No one really wants to talk about it. Um, it. It's something that, you know, pops up when they talk about gun control, right? Mm -hmm. It's blame that person with mental health issues because they have it. But that's the only time when a serious tragedy happens. But every day people go through mental health issues. Every day someone has a challenge and people forget that. And to me, that's the, the most difficult thing to really kind of... Um, push forward it's, it's you it's okay to talk about mental health it's part of everyday lives mm -hmm. just these past few years we've seen an influx of celebrities speak on their own mental health issues and how they're able to cope but is this necessarily helpful to other individuals who are struggling as well mark and the assembly members suggested it's a double-edged sword the influence of celebrities and and major key influencers do does help people come out uh -huh. of the dark and really do talk about mental health and, and and kind of really making it you know normalizing the conversation so we appreciate that fact yeah but then it becomes about that celebrity right and yeah. it's never about the true issues and that's when for me becomes an issue for the organization because we don't want to attach ourselves to that celebrity mm -hmm. we want to attach ourselves to the issue and people always go, oh, this celebrity is doing it. Like all these basketball players, right? Uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin Love talked about it. I, I think a few other NBA stars have talked about it. People talked about the celebrity and how, in, you know, how courageous that celebrity is. But then people forget about the people that have to go through it every day of their lives. And, and to me, that I, I don't want to attach ourselves to that one spot moment yeah. where then every day people are doing it. So it's so important that everybody, not just celebrities, yeah. feel like they have the space to come out and identify themselves mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with this issue. And, mm -hmm. and again, this is something just like we know people, there are many people who go hungry every day. Mm -hmm. We know there's uh, people who have mental health issues every day. Uh, this is a, a common issue. We're just much less aware of it. Right. And it is much less out in the open. As California makes mental health care more accessible to everyone, we must continue to break the stigma and support those who need a helping hand. We end this episode with a couple of thoughts from Mark and the assembly member on how they believe growth for mental health access is progressing. It's not necessarily growing per se, it's just becoming uh, more normal. Okay. So now we're finally recognizing mental health as, as a part of a whole person. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's starting to talk about it and really try to access services. Mm -hmm. And so people are now really reaching out. And that's where you see the actual growth is people coming out of the shadows and really talking about their own mental health issues. So not necessarily growth, but just recognition and, and seeking services. Mm -hmm. I think the way Mark talks about it is, is totally right. It, it's, it's always been there. We just haven't always acknowledged right. it. Uh, the, the way he, he refers to it is more like primary care. Everyone needs primary care. That's not seen as something that's a stigma. That's not something seen as, well, why are you seeing your primary care doctor? Mental health is no difference, right? So, mm -hmm. so again, it's really trying to um, get to the point where mental health care is taking, is treated like primary care. There's, there's no, there's no really no difference. So, so again, I think it's just acknowledging that there's an issue and making sure that we are um, finding ways to treat it at all varieties of levels. Mm -hmm. If you or anyone you know is in distress and needs support, please call the California Peer Run Warm Line at 1-855-845-7415. Again, that's 1-855-845-7415. For more information on anything relating to mental health and access, please visit the National Alliance on Mental Health Illness at nami.org. That's N-A-M-I dot org. I'm Salita DeMessa. Thanks for listening to Look West. The Look West podcast is produced by the California Assembly Democrats. Please subscribe and rate this show wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And when you think of California and politics, remember to look west. <laughs>